good afternoon. Um, and uh, um, I just I just wanted to say welcome to you all. I'm Claire Hopkinson. I'm the director and CEO of the Toronto Arts Council and the Toronto Arts Foundation. I'm really excited to have you join us in this new discussion that centers the voices of artists and arts workers. Um, I also recognize that, uh, you know, these are stressful times and I hope that you're all able to take care of yourself. Um, uh, sorry, uh, yes, here I am. I just had to make sure I had my right notes. So uh, this is part of Toronto Arts Foundation's ongoing research into the importance of the arts in city building and community building. Um, these arts chats have and continue today to bring together and a diverse array of speakers from a, a variety of disciplines throughout this month of March. Together, the, uh, these artists have been discussing timely and understudied issues that affect them, their practice and their impact their work has on audiences, consumers and communities. Uh, collectively, these discussions will help guide our foundation's research strategy towards better supporting advocacy, programming and community building efforts across Toronto and throughout the arts sector as a whole. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge on behalf of the Toronto Arts Foundation, the diversity of the first peoples of this area and recognize the territories of the Wendat, the Ashnabi Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Today, Toronto is still the home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island and around the world. And we are very grateful to have the opportunity to work, to live and to meet on this territory. Arts Chats is made possible and available to you through the generosity of our donors. We are really super grateful for their ongoing support of our work. We invite you all to join us at the Toronto Arts Foundation after this session you'll receive a follow-up email with a link to a feedback survey as well as information on how you can be part of the Toronto Arts Foundation's community-based work and our growing suite of COVID-19 response in effort initiatives. Arts Chats is one of these initiatives. Um, we're trying to help artists and arts organizations with mitigation, resilience and recovery during the pandemic. In this final Arts Chat session of March 2021. Uh, it's called Established on Shifting Sands. We turn to some of Toronto's most established artists to discuss how they have navigated change in our sector and their visions for the future of the arts in our city. Leading this discussion is Zainab Amarae. Zainab's mixed race heritage, which includes African American, Cherokee, Seminole and European informs her work as an author of futurist fiction and nonfiction. Zainab currently sits on the advisory council of Muskrat Magazine and in her role at Children's Peace Theatre, works with BIPOC youth to explore the role of arts in social change, relationship building and personal transformation. I am really very grateful to our exceptional panelists for their insights today. Zainab will introduce them and Zeneb, thank you so much, and over to you. Thank you, Claire. Uh, yeah, welcome everybody. I'm very honored to be moderating this session and I just wanna start out by introducing our esteemed and established panelists. Um, a, lot of, a lot of wisdom on this panel, so I'm, I'm really happy about that. So um, yeah, we'll start out with Claudia Moore. Claudia has been a force on the Canadian dance scene since the late 1970s. She's performed with the National Ballet of Canada and as a featured performer with both Toronto Dance Theatre and the DeRosier Dance Theatre. In 1996, she founded Moonhorse Dance, uh, Moon Horse Dance Theatre, where she continues to perform commissioned works and teach movement to seniors. In 2000, uh, Moore established the internationally acclaimed series Older and Reckless to connect seasoned dance artists to the public uh, in workshops, community projects and live performances. Moore has received the Jacqueline Lemieux Award for Excellence in Dance and was a finalist 
for the 2017 Premier's Award for Excellence in the Arts. Welcome, Claudia. Greg Stutz is Skarure, uh, Tuscarora, Kanekahaga, Mohawk, Haudenosaunee, born in 1963. Greg, if I've mispronounced anything, please correct me later on. Um, he was born in Oshwigan Six Nations of the Grand River Territory, a Toronto-based artist who, whose Haudenosaunee restorative aesthetic employs mnemonics of condolence articulated in diverse visual forms, including photography, sculpture, installation, and video. Stats's practice conceptualizes land as monument embodied with the relation with relational placemaking on his his on reserve lived experience and the explorations of ceremonial orality. His upcoming solo exhibitions, uh, the AGO Contact Photography Festival at Todd Morden Mills and the Art Gallery of Ontario as well. Greg's been nominated for the Scotiabank Photography Award and has been shortlisted for the Robert Gardner Fellowship in Photography of the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnography at Harvard University. Welcome, Greg. Augusto Bitter is a Dora award-winning performer, writer, producer, and facilitator based in Toronto, originally from Venezuela. They've been a resident artist at Canadian Stage, Aluna Theatre, Theatre Passamarai, and Hub 14. Augusto has been an artist educator with Soul Pepper and the Paprika Festival and facilitates creative writing workshops with Story Planet. Food is Augusto's love language. <laughs> I can relate there. So welcome everyone and thanks. Um, are you guys on video? Maybe you can activate your video so folks can see you. <laughs> That's great. Okay, so I've got a number of questions here. I don't know if we'll get through them all. And if we do, we have time left over, then we'll go to the chat box and um, maybe take some questions or comments there. But the first question that I have for you um, is, what are the new challenges of this moment for Toronto's artists and organizations and, and what patterns from the past are resurfacing? So the new challenges and the resurfacing patterns. For anyone who wants to speak to that. I could say that um, staying alive might be the first challenge that uh, we are considering right now. Um, of course, health is top of the agenda. Everyone's health is uh, what really uh, needs addressing and, um, and health brings me to Equality brings me to so many of the issues that are uh, being revealed. Um, I think that um, it's been uh, a terrific shakeup for us in a, in a very positive way to reveal the cracks, to reveal the vulnerabilities, to reveal the weaknesses. And um, I think a real call to action um, which uh, I, I believe we've all tried to respond to in, in our best possible way. I, I commend the Toronto Arts Foundation for the work that you're doing with uh, bringing people together in discussions um, and the many other organizations that have done that to reach out and to listen. I think listening is high on the list. Um, I think that uh, also um, I think it's been clear that the arts uh, are an essential service and um, that, that we've been able to do so much for people, to lift people's spirits and, uh, and to keep people alive and to keep people connected and to keep people happy in a very, very difficult and challenging time. So um, 
out of out of tragedy and um, extreme challenge, uh, I think some really wonderful things are happening. And uh, I just think that um, out of need, we've connected with each other in a way that's also been encouraging. I've have such great admiration for my colleagues who are all doing uh, terrific things to keep um, their art alive, to stay connected uh, with the public. And um, so I, I just, uh, uh, as far as patterns that are resurfacing, um, I, I won't address that right now, but I, um, I'll pass it over to either Greg or Augusto. Thank you. Thanks, Claudia. Yeah, I think um, uh, uh, I think one of the challenges that I think both artists and institutions or groups and collectives are found during at least particularly this last year is um, uh, an, ident an identity crisis in a way, particularly for organizations who um, uh, suddenly had to cancel full seasons and had to cancel a lot of programming and artists had to cancel tours or, or performances or and had to shift online or, you know, those organizations didn't suddenly found themselves asking if, if they're not programming artists, if they're not showing live work in, in the example of live performance spaces, then what are we? What am I? What purpose do we serve in this community? And I think we've seen a lot of different collectives, groups, organizations, and artists try to answer that question and try to connect with their immediate local communities in a way that um, wasn't happening before to the same extent. And questions around accessibility, which is a pattern that has been around for a while, both financial, both, you know, all the different kinds of when you think about accessibility in these spaces. Um, uh, yeah, so it's, it's a matter of, um, I think, redefining what uh, uh, our purpose is as artists in the city and um, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Think, so you, mm -hmm. Greg, go on, please. Yeah. Okay. You know, there's a, there's always been a, you know, what we all do is in terms of we're all, always in service to each other and the work that we produce. And sometimes that, that can be over, you know, that, that can change quite a bit depending on, you know, where the work is coming from and who's making the work and who's deciding who's, who's going to be shown and, and uh, programmed. So I think the biggest thing is the new challenge for this moment in terms of indigenous visual art and all the disciplines therein is that we have to redefine the word inclusion without enclosure. So this whole idea of, you know, bringing in um, and then sometimes in, in terms of resource extraction, this is, this is all this has all come up in the last five, four or five years now, and people are very, very much, you know, we're, we're all aware of these things, how we treat each other, how we treat, and then how we, how we treat the work. So in terms of the restorative aesthetic that I use from Haudenosaunee, from the condolence, it's all about preempting chaos. And we do that by, we communicate, we uh, follow a protocol that everyone knows what, what's going on and, and how things are going to work for the event. And in, in, you know, in Haudenosaunee, there's even a runner who you know, has, a, has a notch stick with some wampum on it. <laughs> and everyone has to touch that stick so that they know that, you know, that they, they've uh, received that message. So I think the fact is that, is that when we, look at Toronto and for example and the patterns of the past are I mean it's inherent in in artist run center culture and regional galleries that you know there is a memory there's a human memory but there's no um, there seems to be no archival memory of, of interactions between people there is of course a, 
a memory of the website and what was shown, but there is no, you know, this was a breakthrough moment because we invited these artists and, and we had this gathering and, but there's, there's not really much of that. So that makes it very difficult for people to, who are coming forward and taking up these new positions to sort of find out what were the past values, what were the roles and responsibilities that this organize that this, their particular organization had. And because uh, I'm hearing a lot of that too from people who are, you know, working with KEG right now and, and there's, they just had their 40th <laughs> and uh, Kamloops. And uh, there's this whole overview of what's been happening. And there's a lot of holes that, that aren't being, uh, that were never filled with information. So I think that's, that's one of the biggest challenges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, yeah, in terms of our process too, I just wanted to um, encourage any of you panelists who, you know, if, if you want to pick up on something that anybody else has raised or further the conversation around that question, please do that. Um, and I don't mind being interrupted at all. So go ahead and do that. Um, yeah, so Greg, you brought us to one of the, um, you know, kind of like pre-answered one of the questions that uh, I have here, um, which is that, you know, organizations uh, are increasingly, even prior to the pandemic, we're increasingly seeing the need to decolonize and, and center historically marginalized voices in all facets of their work. And um, now it feels like, you know, because the, you know, pandemic has kind of, you know, organizations are a reflection of society and, um, you know, everything that's going on in society has been mirrored in our organizations is, is reflected in our organizations. And so, um, you know, a lot of uh, people from these communities are being called on now to come in as resources of one kind or another, as you have mentioned. So um, how do we ensure that we're not further burdening, further re-traumatizing folks who are already the most negatively impacted by this moment that we're in right now? Anyone? Um. Sorry. Go on, please. Okay, so the, well, I think the, a lot of the, in the past, a lot of the, the uh, whenever, when things were, <clears throat> when things, there was, there was a series, you know, uh, when I worked in the 90s, there was always, I actually identified like-minded people, community people, non-native community people who were organizers, who were curators, and decided to work with them. So, you know, because I knew that we had this fundamental foundational um, way of working that there was reciprocal. And over the years, of course, that as acad academia has, has, has taken over sort of that role of, of bringing voices together, a lot has been lost and um, you know, I think the fact that I didn't never went to art school and my on reserve lived experience sort of hypersensitized myself to to the inadequacies of getting getting people together and um, and sharing. You know, in, in my case, the Haudenosaunee, the Great Love Peach was Peace, which is a you know a universal document to be shared with all. Um, so, but now there's a larger hurdle for me to do that. And um, it has a lot to do with language. It has a lot to do with uh, guilt and shame of, of, of Canada. So I think the fact that, you know, doing these type of things and, and, and speaking how I, you know, speak to my friends and colleagues, you know, this is, this is a time to sort of really not only listen, but actively listen to, to have these working relationships that don't um, you know, that, that are inclusive without enclosure. You know, we all saw what happened with 150 and everyone was scurrying around and let's find somebody right away. And, and a lot of the protocols were, were, uh, were not followed and people were upset and, and rightly so. So I think, you know, when, when th those types of things happen with organizations, 
I can speak for myself, but there's there's a whole gambit of things that happen. There's you feel humiliated, you feel you know, here we go again, um, you know, and so I think the fact that there's um, so if organizations truly wanted to work with people, they have to have a, I think more and more now, there has to be more grassroots. And what I mean by that is like, you know, let's work with the uh, Native Women's Resource Center. Let's work with people on the ground, Anishinaabe Health. Let's, you know, let's bring in council fire. You know, let's, I mean, I, when I grew up, I grew up on the reserve and in service to o older people and and then when I came here, I was at Anishinaabe Health and board on the board there and the Native Center. And I worked at Saint Paul, Trinity St. Paul's Community Center. So I know, you know, what that looks like. And I think that a lot of people don't. So there's a, and of course, nowadays, as I said before, there, there is uh, the barriers of, of social media and electronic com communication where a, lot's, a lot is constantly being lost. We don't pick up the phone. We don't, you know, to it is back and forth, and you know, and and then there's lots of room for those protocols to slip by. Um, but I think the fact that you know, myself, I'm not sure if I'm going to be doing these things much longer because I am tired and it is it is quite exhausting. However, there are other people who do, <laughs> and it's the organizations. Uh, organizations um, responsibility to find those people and have a intergenerational representation. So just not the youngest and the, you know, but the, the older people, I mean, Maria Campbell and, and uh, Alan East, they have, there's this book called Give Back and they were always talking about, you know, we always have to have the older women at the table. So and I think that can that methodology can also transfer to, to non-native people too, like intergenerational input on, on some of these sports. Anyways, I have spoken. <laughs> Thank you. Now, do you mind repeating the original question because my internet cut out as you were speaking. Oh, no. okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. So I'll just read it as, it, as I'm seeing it here. Um, as organizations increasingly see the need to decolonize and center historically marginalized voices in their work, how can we ensure that we're not further burdening and re-traumatizing those who are already the most negatively impacted? Mm. Yes, thank you. And thank you, Greg. It really resonated a lot with um, what you, a lot has been lost. And I think about a lot of the um, students, a lot of young artists going through their um, training program of choice and those artists who are culturally diverse, who um, do experience some kind of disability, who do are, um, uh, uh, different in some way. And so many of those artists have uh, been lost because they, they haven't been supported in the right ways and they haven't, mm. um, they haven't been allowed to connect with their, they haven't been allowed to celebrate their communities that they're coming from and, and to investigate that and to show them mentors that look like them, that think like them, that, that um, have similar goals. And um, I think a, a way potentially to try to avoid some of that harm that has happened and continues to happen is um, treating it like a holistic ecosystem. It's all part of the same body. So training programs and organizations and um, event spaces, galleries, theater and dance companies, things like that. Um, uh, uh, speaking to that generational um, spirit that you're talking about, Greg, trying to trying to keep um, trying to reduce the harm, not just immediately by by a solidarity statement or by suddenly hiring a, 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 an artistic director of color, but by really focusing on 
as much of the community as we can. And by going from the older generation to the newest artists to try to get them in contact and try to get this cross pollination that I think can only make us stronger and better artists, richer artists and humans also at the end of the day. And I think that a lot of curators and directors of organizations forget that with indigenous artists and the young, younger generation and those of us who are my age, our lived experience is part of our work. It's part of our identity. It's constantly changing. So at one point we may say yes, and we, at one point we say no, depending on that. Um, but yes, when you have those two world, those jagged world, two world views colliding, it can be pretty, you know, pretty devastating for younger students. Um, and then, you know, and then there's a, even within um, organizations who are, who have said, you know, laid out all this, this, these statements of inclusivity and equity, there's a lot of language there that is per performative. And there's not really any subsequent action. I mean, people say they're going to do these things, but they're, you know, okay, where is that workshop with 20 Indigenous youth? You know, did you actually go to Gabriel Dumont and do this? <laughs> you know, um, and, and then on top of that, sometimes you have people of color who are not indigenous, who are making decisions about who's, who's gonna be let in, you know, indigenous person, who's, they're programming indigenous activities. And I just, I resigned from a member of, uh, from my membership of a said organization just recently because of that, you know, and um, it was done on, such, on the fly and it was, uh, not thought about and um, it was insulting actually, you know, um, so I told them so. But they have, but a lot of people have these, these um, mini manifestos of inclusion that are, that are just like, when people see that, especially young people, it's like, oh my God, here we go again, you know. It's like, we, it's almost the equivalent of, uh, you know, we take these things very seriously and, and well, <laughs> please hold the line. <laughs> So we can find one of one of your own, <laughs> or or we can actually hop in a cab and go to the Native Women's Resource Center and talk to them and and discuss what their needs are and how if if and when we can help them, just to let people know that they're there, that organizations are there to help, you know. But yeah, I do agree with you. It is a holistic um, uh, conundrum of of. You know, and it's, you know, and in a lot of the cases, it's my, it's, it's, it's just my responsibility to sort of point that out to people and remind them of that, you know, take a step back, you know, um, and, and remind people that this is an emotional time. This is a heavily emotional time. And I think that it's, that is what, what Indigenous people have been, have been experiencing for many years and, and, and even since the, the TRC and the, and all of these, all of this evidence, you see it's the evidence that's there now for all Canadians to see and to feel. And it's like, what are you gonna do with that? You know, do you, uh, and, and how, because their methodologies aren't working. So it's a whole reset and a redefinition of what an inclusiveness is and redefinition of what, um, but there, as I said, there is a tendency to still sort of group people together in BIPOC or, you know, these types of, of uh, anagrams that, that are more easily to roll off the tongue of our non-native people. <laughs> so if they can't say the whole thing, <laughs> then there's, you know, um, but anyways, yeah, the, that, that's, that, that's what I wanted to say on that question. Thanks. So yeah, just um, yeah, I just feel like uh, there's there's kind of some issues with the question, and I you know was part of well, I developed these questions based on previous conversations that we've had, but I really think feel like this idea that 
you know, organizations, you know, sometimes think they're doing, you know, communities a favor by including or that they're ticking off a funder box or whatever, um, without thinking for themselves about how much they can grow from taking direction and taking guidance from, you know, uh, folks that they have, you know, are developing relationships with basically. And I think that's key in terms of, um, uh, you know, how people become included or invited into a place. It's, it's about building those relationships uh, and deepening those relationships. And I think that we're all in a position of growing. We're all in a position of expanding our consciousness and expanding our creative capacities um, when we come at it from the relationship uh, point of view. So thanks folks for, for that. Add, uh, yeah. Just a quick question. Like, yeah, it's like, if you look at place making and space and it'd be like, you know, having a, a dancer come into a space and, and you know, a variety of different sizes and the people in charge at the front desk are booking them into a, too, a, a space too small. <laughs> that's, not a, that's not adequate for them to express themselves. And, uh, and then there's a, a shortened time period, <laughs> you know, on top of that. Yeah. You, can only do this, you can only have the space for this long and then you have to clean up and then you have to wash the floors and you have to do all this stuff for the next person. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's the sort of analogy I'd use. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So, um, you know, in, a pre in our previous discussions, we've talked about um, how many spaces. It's a very nice segue that you've given me, uh, Greg, even though it was, um, you know, an analogy. But, you know, we are losing a lot of our art spaces in Toronto. And so I'm wondering if you all have any thoughts about how we can recover what's been lost and retain uh, what we have left. Yeah, I, uh, Greg's preempt chaos really um, sparked something for me because uh, The pandemic, uh, so many of our dance spaces are closing. Um, we're losing important uh, studios where many people, groups of, of all backgrounds have been working together. And um, don't ask me why it came as a shock. And, and again, you know, I, I, I refer to Greg, I experienced uh, humiliation. I experienced embarrassment. Why the hell didn't we look at this earlier? We were so, we got so complacent with existing um, on the bare minimum, you know, with, with, with the least possible resources and, and kind of, um, I think uh, I'm speaking for mostly the dance community. That's what I know right now. But I think that, you know, we were so busy keeping that balance between, you know, our work and our life and, and our space and it was all kind of working okay. And then suddenly, Suddenly the spaces are gone and, and we feel completely ridiculous to be, to, to, to be honest, I feel ridiculous. Why did we not take this earlier to the councils? Why did we not look at, for example, the, the Dover Courthouse, which is an important dance space for the community? Why did we not look at that? Why did we not know that there wasn't a lease? Why did we not, why did we not know that suddenly the, the rent went up so high that the tenant who had so, um, diligently kept us, kept that space working for us for so many years, had to leave and, and hence the thing fell apart. Um, you know, it, it's very interesting that um, just yesterday or the day before on Facebook, uh, dear Jessa Aglio, who is a, a wonderful um, arts worker and um, creative thinker, posted the fact that um, in the UK, where they kind of get the arts, and there, I have to say there's a lot more support and stability for artists there, um, they just acquired a huge space. Um, it's got a thousand affordable workspaces for London's artists and makers for making space for art, and they've got a lease that's 999 years. Um, so, you know, this is, this is the kind of thing that I think we're really missing here in Toronto. Um, 
the established companies have their homes and and their associated challenges. I, I, I know that it's, it's, it's extremely challenging to be able to maintain a space at this point, but, um, but we do need to protect our spaces. Um, artists are just managing, they're just managing to, to, to keep their lives uh, in balance. And when our space is taken away, then we can't even do our work. So um, anyway, it's just something that absolutely needs to be addressed. I think we need, our, we need to advocate, we need to raise our voices, we need to get many people involved in this conversation. Um, otherwise, yeah, Toronto's just going to be that city that's too expensive to live in, and there's not going to be an art scene at all. Um, so a lot of work needs to be done in that area, as far as I can see. Thank you. I think there's also room for, I think, you know, Claudia, you mentioned Dover Courthouse, and what I always loved about Dover, Dover Courthouse was the, the, the variety of, of people and groups and the way that space shifted depending on who was in there and what they were doing and, and many different um, disciplines and people colliding all the time. Um, and I think there's a, a, an opportunity for um, uh, those organizations and companies or whoever's making these decisions that have spaces um, to create more of that collaboration, more of that space sharing, more um, and, and on a multidisciplinary level too, I think, you know, there's so many like old, old Canadiana theaters, for example, that have giant spaces that don't share it, you know? And I know that's expensive. I know there's so many other things that I as an independent artist have no clue how that works. But um, I think um, in imbuing these spaces with a, a greater variety of artists and disciplines, like I said, in, in the first thing, I think can only, I think, improve uh, uh, the e ecosystem of artists and the, um, the uh, try to bridge across different disciplines that feel so disparate in a city like, like Toronto. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'm appreciating this um, idea of bringing in other folks as well. Um, you know, there's all kinds of other uh, groups that are working in other sectors that uh, could, you know, we could be sharing our concerns with and we could be uh, working together around these issues. So for sure. Um, I'm also thinking too, because when I worked in community services, you know, Toronto owns a lot of space, a lot of buildings, and, all, and I don't want to take anything away from housing at all, but there are some, you know, buildings that are more suitable to mm -hmm. arts practices than to, um, to uh, housing. And I'm wondering, you know, what kinds of arrangements can be made to make those spaces available to arts organizations and artists. So thanks for that, folks. Um, anything else right. to say? Yeah. yeah, I think the fact that too, you know, a long time in the 90s, I mean, I've been exhibiting full time since 88. So our friend Jenny Stoke always used to tell me that, um, you know, there are really good arts administrators out there that have, that have to be, you know, um, nurtured and, and brought forward and that it all can't be left onto the, on the shoulders of artists to run organizations. So that these people who are, you know, what she did with the Theatre Alliance and, and, and elsewhere, really, you know, the advocacy was the main thing. Um, and here we are, we're trying to leave it to the MP, MPs or MPPs here. And, you know, then we have Lisger happen and, you know, that all blew up. And so, so if we, you know, if there's nobody in our corner and as, as workers and, and artists, we're busy doing our thing. I mean, we're exhausted enough. So I think the fact that for organizations and artists too, to really foster younger people who are like-minded, who are born advocates to take on these positions in, in, in small and large arts organizations, you know, and that, that have experience outside of academia in the community in the disciplines, you know, and it just can't, just can't be a resume, you know, um, it has to be a, a presence 
you know, that has to be nurtured and felt in the community. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, yeah, ab absolutely, Greg. I, I just want to second that emotion. Uh, you know, uh, I would so rather be um, working on a performance right now. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm, I've grown up with my art and I uh, have been asking myself why over, over so many years, you know, why dance, why arts? And, uh, you know, at this stage, we, we, we have a concrete understanding of why we're doing what we're doing and also for, for the importance of it in society. Uh, but absolutely, we weren't trained to advocate. Um, uh, we were trained for all kinds of things, and we're, we've got a huge discipline and uh, and lots of energy, that's for sure, and, and, and a lot of good ideas. But we absolutely need people to advocate and uh, people to help us make, make these connections, create these bridges um, with other communities um, and also with those who can help to uh, solidify the... The, the very basic elements that we need in order to do our work. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. And also for indigenous, um, like people, like I grew up on Six Nations on reserve and uh, grew up around a lot of older people. And there was a constant push to be in service, to be helping, to just sort of like, even to go to the neighbors saying, do, do, do you think done today? This type of service, coupled with the fact that the Haudenosaunee great law of peace, you know, requires us to go out and do, and, and, and share this type of, this share this message of, of elevating each other's minds for mental health. There's a huge pull to this, as Haudenosaunee to do that. However, you throw in some, some lateral violence trauma, some, you know, some really bad stuff that happens to us, including myself. And it just, you know, it, it creates this huge conflict within me to sort of like, to be hyper vigilant. And um, I mean, it's a, if I was to write policy, I'd probably be very good at it, but because I would know, you know, I already know bad things can happen, right? And I think as artists, we're constantly dealing with the fact that, you know, our bodies, our, our minds, you know, bad things are going to happen. So, you know, we're, we're responding to that, we're responding to the, to, the, to the COVID. Our minds go back to the Spanish flu, our, you know, constant, this constant back and forth, and I call it the return, you know, in a constant state of return. And uh, yeah, so that's sort of my makeup, so that if you can take what I just said and, and you know, apply it to a lot of different in, in indigenous peoples when they're when we're called upon to do these types of things where we're speaking and we're a lot of us can't do it we can but at a price uh and not for and for for uh, for a period of time so our advocacy is is dependent on largely our our state of mind and our mental health and and our and our life's journey you know, so I think that that's what people have to remember when they're when they're going through the little Rolodex of of uh, of um, pick a scone, <laughs> you know, pick a trying to find an indigenous person to to do this. And I mean, that's where the networking comes in. That's where outreach comes in. I mean, you know, there's you could just you could dial Bev Jacobs on Six Nations as a lawyer and, and started the missing and murdered women like 16 years ago, and she would talk. You know, she she does these great talks. There are people out there, so it's about networking. And and then the, the, those of us who are artists can get on with what we have to do, which is difficult enough, tough enough. <laughs> Awesome. Okay, thanks. Over to me. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm going to skip a few questions here because I want to get to, um, you know, since this is sponsored by the Toronto Arts Council and it's part of um, their research work. Uh, if we have time to go back to the other questions, I'll do that. But I want to make sure this question comes in and that is where do funders and donors most need to focus their energy and resources at this time and in the near future? 
Go ahead, everybody. thoughts you've spoken to some of it yeah but i, I think there's do you want me to shut up or no right, okay. go ahead. there's there's a tendency to for funders and donors to to only focus on awards and where i come from it's just that's another world view and what i mean by that is that if i could see funders and donors um focusing their energies and resources on on collaborations between organizations you know um not necessarily singling out one person to you know to be the hero of that of that effort so you know if there is more funders and more and then and i mean i've always always talked about outreach even back in 1990 with ontario arts council it was always been a they're like, what's outreach? You know? <laughs> and, uh, um, and I've always like, there are prerequisites for outreach, but if, if the funders and donors could actually take a look at, okay, well, these are the things we need to do in, in terms of broadening and including uh, and on a re reciprocal racial relationship, these activities, these sharing in the spirit of sharing not really heavy, heavy on the outcome, uh, obviously outcome, uh, but but more along the lines of what did we what did we share, and and people can then go away so to to think about it, and then then they can start doing uh, more work. Yeah, that's what I would suggest. Yeah, I, I agree, Greg. I think um, uh, I think focusing on um, developing and incubating. You know, I think I think it's very uh, all these all these statements or or the goals or intentions of these funding programs or donors or organizations. A lot of it is already at least verbally, at least on page, saying that you know prioritizing underrepresented voices, BIPOC, whatever, all of all, of all those different labels and monikers. Um, but I think, uh, 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 I think we're in serious need of some healing and not everyone is, um, uh, that for me as an individual feels like a really big task, obviously. Uh, and it's something that has to be done collectively. But I think, um, you know, Queer and trans communities, indigenous communities, black communities have found ways to sustain their communities and to find and to, to, to sustain their ways of healing and their ways of connecting with each other. And I think infusing these organizations with that kind of community support and community advocacy and, you know, I have a dream where it's like this giant space where there's theater and there's film and there's dance and there's a community organization that deals with you know, young families, who knows? And there's a photography studio and there's, so having that kind of, um, yeah, I'm really stuck on, on, on this idea of not siloing ourselves and creating more opportunities um, to relate to each other and kind of meet each other more um, honestly as, as human beings and not just, I, I think I really resonated to what you, you, you spoke about, Greg, about the, the sharing and the, the process and not so much the, the, the product. So using these, these community organizations in within these artistic spaces to um, really focus on our well-being so that our art is better, but that our, our lives are better, our communities are better, our relationships are better too. Yeah, I, I totally um, second what, what both of you are saying, but um, the idea of, of, a, of funds that support processes of collaboration. So it's not just a box that you tick off, but it is an actual uh, project that um, that connects to organizations over a period of time. I, I think it's really the only way that we're going to start to really hear each other, understand 
each other and uh, and to begin the kind of sharing and the kind of um, community focus that, that needs to happen. So, you know, for instance, I, I had a lovely older and reckless uh, edition in um, two years ago in 2019. We had magnificent indigenous performers on, on the program. Um, we had talks, we had workshops, and it was it was fantastic. But um, there weren't that many indigenous audience members. Um, you know, try as we might to reach out. It's it's not just an invitation. It it, it does need to be a process, I believe. And um, so, wouldn't it be great if around a project like that, there was also funding to support conversations in indigenous organizations, community organizations to, to actually stimulate interest and um, uh, and a desire, a desire to, to come together and, and share. So yeah, funding process would be great. I mean, exactly uh, those, it's those place, place making projects where you take the collaboration to someone else's home and space where they know that they're safe, this is their space, this is where all their memories are in that organization. So, you know, and to have this meaningful, to have these visitors come and collaborate in, in that meaningful, and it stays in that space too, you know, it really does. I mean, I was just thinking, even if it's, even if it's a satellite, like what, what uh, Emily and Philip did at uh, AGYU, and it took um, three, almost three or four years to have a, a strong working relationship with the Mississaugas of the New Credits, just part of Six Nations. So they had this whole long, uh, where they would go and meet with the community and vice versa and, and, and and that way, the spaces became the, the the reserve space from New Credit was then transferred to the to the AGYU, and it could. There's this welcoming feeling that you know that was created in terms of um, expressing themselves and including including people from New Credit to work with uh, visiting artists from Brazil and from all over the world. So, I mean, that's ideally, but even if it was just a small, you know, artist run center or, or dance or, you know, uh, theater that could go to some, some small um, artist, you know, small native organization, because what's been happening is obviously is is that a lot, most of the artists run centers are now institutionalized. And that's a problem because <laughs> there's, there's a whole model there and a whole, you know, their whole identity is quite tight. So, anywho. Okay, so um, yeah, our time is up here, but I just want to thank you all. I just feel like it's been a really rich discussion. Um, so yeah, thank you for sharing your time and your thoughts and thank you uh, to all the viewers as well. I'm gonna kick it over to Claire to close us out here. Thank you so much, um, Zainab, for leading this important discussion. I've been listening intently and jotting down notes and it's, it's really, really resonates. And I wanna thank Greg, Claudia, and Augusta for contributing really incredibly insightful perspectives and ideas. Uh, it's a privilege to hear from you about what's happening and how you're feeling and how you're seeing things. So this was the final session in our March 2021 Arts Chats series. We've really been you know, delighted to, to start this series and I've been very excited to listen to all the conversations and perhaps it's also because I've been missing those casual conversations that I was always party to in a normal course of time. Um, and uh, it's, it, it truly is fabulous to have such an exceptional groups of creative minds here over the last four weeks. Um, learned a lot, 
and really appreciate the range of knowledge and perspectives that our contributors have brought. Um, so I want to thank you all and all of our panelists and moderators over the last month. I want to thank you most sincerely. I also want to give a bit of a shout out to Dr. Sean Newman, uh, who started this uh, series as his brainchild and to the foundation team for their great good work in making this series come to life. I, I hope it has a future. Um, so it, for any of you uh, out there, I want to thank you for coming and joining us. Uh, we're going to share these um, sessions. An announcement will come out, so if you've missed one, you can you can um, participate or, or listen to it in the future, and you can um, share it with others who you think it would be interesting to hear. This is part of a larger research initiative. Well, I'll just say thank you again, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to Morris here. You've been fabulous <laughs> in helping us out this last month. And uh, yeah, don't show up next week, OK? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. And all of you will see you again, hopefully sooner rather than later. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay positive. Thank you. Bye, everyone.